Welcome to the Principles of Performance podcast, where we discuss how to optimize your health, fitness, and performance. Drawing on decades of experience of working as coaches, consultants, and trainers to top performers, athletes, and teams from professional sports to top universities to the U.S. military, Eric Degatti and Mike Perry discuss topics and strategies of how to perform at your highest level and be your very best. Join us and our friends and colleagues who are leaders in the fitness and performance industry as we investigate and challenge the most popular training, nutrition, lifestyle, and recovery protocols. And away we go. Here we are with the Principles of Performance podcast. I am your host, Eric Degatti, along with my friend and co-host, Mike Perry. Mike, welcome to episode number 74. It's uh, it's good to be back. Yeah, we're excited about today's guest. We were just reminiscing about some some areas that we both were familiar with. And uh, now I'm looking forward to today's guest, but I'm going to go ahead and let you finish up with the bio. Yeah, another original Boston area guy. And if I let you two go, it's it's going to be talking about Noma and the Sox and Chowda. And and I got to try to keep this thing on the rails here today. But Better we than have, coffee. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we have uh, a good friend of mine, Coach Chris Johnson. Uh, and uh, Coach Johnson is currently the quarterback's coach at Monroe College in New York. And he's also serves as a quarterback coach and offensive coordinator at the high school level for over the last 20 years in both New York and New Jersey, where his quarterbacks receive postseason honors uh, in 17 of those seasons. Uh, he's also the founder and co-director of Complete QB. It's a nationally recognized quarterback development camp that he's been doing since 2000. And he routinely serves as a clinician at football seminars and clinics around the country. And uh, his assessment and coaching skills have earned him a solid reputation among coaching peers and thousands of athletes for his, to develop, his ability to develop quarterbacks. So we're going a little bit different today, Mike. We're going to talk about specifically a unique niche of, of developing a certain athlete. And so Coach Johnson, I got to work with first meeting him through complete QB camps and got to speak at a couple of his camps and then got to be working with him uh, as a strength and conditioning coordinator when he was at Hudson Catholic. So it's it's been a, a fun journey together and we may even have some other stuff cooking up. But welcome to the show, Chris. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Uh, excited to be here. And I think uh, it's a it's a it's a topic I love talking about. I know you guys do as well. So we're uh, we're excited to go here today. Excellent. So uh, in the game of football, the quarterback position is, is is so important to the team's success. And with so much riding on one player, how do you begin to evaluate whether or not that player has the right makeup for the job? Well, I think uh, something to keep in mind when it comes to quarterback play is uh, there's a there's a bit of art. There's a bit of science to it when we identify the right guy. Um, we'll obviously talk a, a great bit today about mechanics, physical movement all the things on that side of the quarterback equation. Uh, but there is a, a lot that's uh, far more subjective when it comes to things like, things like leadership, the way, that, the way someone carries themselves, for example. You may take someone that physically may not be as impressive, may not be as capable and gifted, um, but has some of those, as we say sometimes, in talent evaluation, the intangibles. You know, uh, But I do think that there are uh, some baseline characteristics that we'd like to be able to see. Uh, we get the Boston jokes out of the way. They have to have arm strength, right? Uh, so we want to make sure that they can they can, they can throw a football. Um, but that there's so much more to it um, because, as you kind of pointed out, there's so much riding on that one individual. Um, we we have to make sure that someone has that basic prerequisite physical, you know, set of abilities. But I think we'll dive into this a little bit deeper as we continue the conversation. It's not always just one set of characteristics. There can be different archetypes or prototypes of quarterbacks that therefore re require different types of skill sets. So I think it's a pretty varied, a varied thing. I always like to start with personality and makeup because I think it speaks to the way that they can execute and utilize their physical capabilities. So, yeah, before we even get into like the different types of quarterbacks, uh, I do want to mention that the only thing that kept me from playing with the Yankees was my size and speed and lack of talent, but I did have all the intangibles um, myself. Um, so, 
So let's talk about how much the position of quarterback has evolved over the years. And, and even just in the year years of coaching, um, you know, because now all the way down to the youth level, you see teams that are running spread offenses, uh, run options, these different things that are different than the traditional, you know, step back three times and, and, and throw a football. So talk about that evolution and how coaches have had to adapt to coaches and athletes have had to adapt to that. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's kind of been in parallel lanes with the evolution of offensive football in general. So, you know, date back to, you know, somebody my age, played football almost entirely under center. Um, I had a high school football coach who was a, a little bit forward thinking. And I mean, we did some radical stuff. We used something called shotgun formation occasionally. And so we'd be <laughs> not under center, but for the most part, the game was pretty standard. Uh, and even today we see, even as much as the games evolve, we see that so many teams do exactly what the other teams do. But back back then, uh, the skill set that was required was somebody who could take a, obviously a snap under center create depth physically by, you know, getting to a drop and set up, set up to pass. And then what would nowadays probably be regarded as a relatively predictable run game um, with an eye formation or a power eye. And some folks ran the wing tee, uh, but now uh, so much more is uh, featured with the quarterback position and offenses in general. Now we have the opportunity to build on what those offenses used to be, put someone in the shotgun, have uh, some depth in a deep passing game, quick decisions in the short passing game wrinkles that have come around 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 in the last decade or two have included RPOs and that sort of thing. So um, the amount of different things that quarterbacks need to do well, I think has opened the door to less, uh, less of a focus simply on someone who can be a quarterback and has opened the door to the possibility that you can teach an athlete to play the quarterback position. And that's the biggest thing that I think I've seen, is sometimes a coach will just say, because of the stuff that I want to do offensively, I'm going to take my best wide out or I'm going to take a really athletic running back and, and I'm going to turn him loose and teach him enough of the quarterback stuff, make sure he's an adequate enough passer um, and, and let him play the position. I've seen some of that. Um, so I think, I think it's been exciting. It's been fun. But also uh, the job of training quarterbacks has evolved right along with it because there are guys who are simply asked to do different types of things, you know? All right. So, uh, you know, some athletes can get lost in, in development due to, to coaches, right? Just trying to, to mold them and put them into systems as opposed to building everything yeah. around them. How do you customize things? How do you get, how do you put people in the right scenarios? Uh, I know you said you don't have exact sort of routes or char characteristics, but yeah. is there like, how do you, do you see things early on or I, I'm just yeah. curious how you sort of analyze that process? Cause I imagine it's, it's a moving set of field goal posts as you go and develop. Correct. Yeah. I think that's definitely the case. So one of the things that it's funny, I went, I went with uh, my son, my youngest son and a, and a couple of friends to a Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving day, high school football game. Um, you know, just last, just, you know, just recently. And so when, when we were there, I remember thinking, so there was one team in particular, and I try not to be that coach who's in the stand saying, why are they doing that? I try because I've been there and I know that there usually are reasons for things. But I noticed, for example, that one of the teams was running pretty consistently running sprint out. And they were running sprint out, a sprint out attack with a quarterback who I didn't personally think in my, you know, two hour evaluation of these guys that watched them play the position. I didn't think he was very good at being able to get out side the tackles and get out on the run and make decisions, throw the ball or potentially run it. Not only that, but he was right-handed. And I saw him sprint out a lot to his left, which I found some, some folks are great at that. Some people can go opposite their dominant side on sprint out, for example, and be really good at rotating their trunk and getting the ball out. This guy was not. And I felt like it kind of, it left that offense a little bit hamstrung. And so it, it just kind of that day, as I watched all that unfold, it kind of underscored for me, which that which is pretty important for me, and that is if you know that you've got a quarterback coming up who's going to be your quarterback, say, for the year or for the next couple of years, he's the best possible uh, alternative for you or best possible option for you, I think it's really important to design stuff that suits their skill set. Um, something that I think, and we've all been guilty of this, and I'm at the front of that line, is sometimes you, you get into a groove, you, you take a snapshot in time, and you say you have one of your best teams ever. You have one of your most successful offenses ever, and you had a particular guy running as your quarterback. Um, 
And because of the success you had there, you sometimes, and it's not logical and it's not fair, you kind of transfer that forward to subsequent years and say, like, this has always been successful for us. But the skill set, the personality, the makeup might be really different at one or more positions, in particular quarterback. So I think it's really key that, uh, and it helps when you have a good staff around you, you don't have yes guys. You have folks who could say to you, like, this is not what this guy does well, man. We need to reinvent. We need to rethink how we approach the position. So I think kind of an annual reassessment or at a minimum when there's new personnel shuffling in and out that we just kind of step back and say, let's make a case. I try to do that pretty much annually. Say, let's make a case for the stuff that we have in the playbook and the types of offensive you know, attacks that we have and say, does it fit the people that we have? And if it doesn't, you know, we, you should be able to make a pretty simple like the old elevator conversation, you should be able to make a 15 or 30 second case for why we have, you know, why we run sprint out or why we run outside zone, why we run gap scheme, those sorts of things. You know? So we've also seen over that time, the physical archetypes of the quarterback change dramatically and you have success coming kind of in all shapes and sizes from, yeah. you know, Ben Roethlisberger at six, five, a stationary type of guy to Kyler Murray, who's five, nine and, and completely different type of physical makeup. Uh, is there certain physical characteristics that are, that are just non-negotiable though, that are kind of minimums uh, theoretically to be a successful quarterback? Yeah, well, I think um, so when you started to name names, I think some folks have an easier time getting a clear vision to be able to throw the ball down the field. No matter how uh, gifted someone is at moving from the pocket, how athletic they are and can get out and run, there's still – we have to keep in mind that – take Lamar Jackson, for example. He's – what we think about is him taking off and, and doing what he does out in open field. But if we go and watch him play on a weekly basis, we realize how many times he actually has to operate from within the pocket. So the, the biggest thing that I, I, I look for, mostly because there's a, a finite number of guys who can play the position and play it well at every level. We've seen that. I mean, look at some of the – so some teams at, at the college level, or probably at the NFL level now, that we see scrambling a little bit to figure out who's going to be our guy for you know replacement for injury. There's teams with multiple injuries. Happens every year, but especially in 2023, we've seen it. So, um, but the, the one thing I think that stands out for me is we've seen different types of people be successful. So let's compare a Ben Roethlisberger to a, say, recently retired, another recently retired guy, Drew Brees. Um, very different physically. Drew Brees significantly shorter than, um, Drew Brees looks a lot more like the guy you maybe, you know, standing next to online at the coffee shop than, than some of the typical NFL athletes. But I think one thing that they all share is the ability to find themselves throwing lanes. That's a really important thing. No matter how high a release Drew Brees ever comes up with, he's not getting it over some offensive, the typical offensive lineman in the NFL who's taking a kick, a kick drop, a kick slide and, and getting depth in pass protection. He's not getting up over the top as he delivers the ball. The ability to move laterally, back and forth, up and down in the pocket, I think is a really crucial one. That's probably something that I've spent a lot of time in recent years is making sure that my quarterbacks understand, have a really good understanding of protection and the way that the protection scheme set up so that they have the, when, when, when the bullets are flying and we're in live action, that they have a pretty good understanding of where opportunities to slide in that mass of bodies that plays out in front of them, how they can maneuver to get themselves in a clear lane to throw the football. I think it's, it might sound a little bit over, oversimplified, but I think those guys who are able to do that, the flip side of that coin is I've seen some guys gifted with, you know, decent size that simply don't have that, that, I don't know if we call it an intangible, but just that sense of where to move to be able to deliver the football. And it can significantly alter their launch point and make them a less, less effective quarterback just because they were doing it essentially um, with a blind eye because they weren't in a good throwing lane to be able to deliver the ball. So for me, Many of the, the drills initially that I put quarterbacks through are simple reaction drills and their ability to see physical stimulus and be able to just move in the appropriate direction to set themselves up before we even start talking about the way that they throw the football. Why? Because there's such a huge emphasis, and I'm sure we'll get more into this, there's such a huge emphasis on quarterbacks, simply the act of throwing. Uh, we're not trying to produce, Eric, you and I have had probably in the hundreds of hours of conversations around quarterback passing mechanics and certainly just football, you know, movements in general. And we're never going to 
uh, we're not trying to win a passing competition. We are not trying to just generate guys who look great throwing routes on air or just perform camps. We're trying to develop guys who are effective football players at the quarterback position. So I think we have to keep that in mind about the things that we emphasize. Obviously, passing mechanics are crucial, but I put way at the top of my list a guy who can move appropriately and, and get himself in the right position pre-launch, pre-delivery of the ball. So to that point, um, you know, at the, one of the things you've seen with quarterbacks is that they're becoming more and more athletic. Yeah. And it's not just how much, you know, their traditional arm strength um, yeah. is, is being a marker for their success. So if I gave you the option, if I could give you somebody who doesn't have natural throwing ability or, you know, a naturally an arm that just kind of picks up a rock and throws it across the pond, but yeah. just super athletic, or I got the kid who can, who can launch it over the pond, but is not all that athletic, which one are you going to pick? So you had to put me on the spot, Eric. So uh, I think one of, one of the things that let – me, let me start by saying, so I'm a former defensive coordinator. 20-some-odd years ago, I, was, uh, I spent three years as a high school defensive coordinator, which really, I think, informed the way that I coach both quarterbacks and offense overall. Um, and here's why. That was kind of the dawn of that era. There was a quarterback who was at Clemson University at that time. If you see if you remember this name, he wanted – returning punts, I think, in the NFL. His name was Woody Dansler. And he was the first quarterback that I recall um, at, at the major college level that kind of ushered in that new era of quarterbacks that could take off and go a little bit, in addition to being able to throw the ball effectively in more, you know, in a more traditional, uh, a more traditional scheme. And the thing that makes it in real football terms, something that's backbreaking, I think many defensive guys will tell you this, is when you've got a team at third and 11, and you've done a really good job, um, you know, being in spots and making plays and taking away big gains. And then you do so on a third and 11, third and 15, and you have that guy who simply just pulls the ball down and just goes and gets 16 yards on third and 15. It's a backbreaker. So we all love to have that. All of that said, if I can have the word that's used too often now, an elite level um, passer, someone who has the ability to deliver the ball. The reason that I would probably choose that person is because guys who are out and on the run a lot subject themselves to a lot of physical punishment. Uh, typically they do anyway. So if I can reduce the number of hits that my quarterback is going to be able to take, and I have someone who has really um, has an ability to step and deliver the ball with minimum delay to the right spot, um, throw into the right leverage relative to the defense, I think I'd take that guy. There's a mental component to it, obviously. You have to know where we're throwing it. We have to anticipate things well and see, see things well pre-snap. But if I had to pick one of them, um, I'd take option C. I say I want it all on one guy. But I'll take, I'll take the guy who has the, I guess, kind of the traditional capability to play the position. What's interesting, and, and I'm thinking as you're telling me this, is that now you're getting guys that are coming up kind of the next generation is now you're getting guys that come up where you don't have to make that choice. And not only that, but you have guys that when they do go and, and tuck and run, that they're not the, the nail, that they're the hammer. And you look at, you know, what's happening right now with the Philadelphia Eagles, what Jalen Hurts is doing. And all you hear about is every time they do this, this short yardage run where it is money in the bank that he's going to gain you two or three yards is it is almost always, um, you know, followed up with, or, or the precursor to that is how he puts, he squats 600 pounds in the gym. Yeah. And that is, that is not, that is not your norm as your quarterback. But when you have a quarterback that's as strong as a fullback, that is another dimension that, that defenses have to deal with. Yeah, it really does. And I think just, and, and you've got my, my wheels turning as you, as you describe that. I think the wrinkle there. So I said that I'd prefer the guy who's really effective as a pocket guy who really can throw the ball with some juice and, and, and deliver it in, in good spots from the pocket. I also think that I've seen an uptick in the occurrence of coming across a guy who can do just enough running the ball. So maybe he's not the Lamar type. He's putting on a show and he's just gone and he's, you know, he's gone for 40, but it really can also be backbreaking when you have a guy who can do just enough in the RPO game, say, to pull the ball from a running back, gain you four or five yards. It's such a threat that a defense has to account for that it changes the way that defense gets played. But typically, you'll see more guys, say, either committed to the box pre-snap or defenders less likely to vacate the box as quickly in pass 
coverage, et cetera. So I think all that kind of ties together well. Um, and I do think that I'm seeing more and more, just like just like we've seen in the NFL at all levels, seeing that guy who's just got that capability. And, and I don't know that I, I, I can draw a specific or a very, very clear answer to that, but I suspect it probably is kind of the evolution and development of the way that athletes in general train, uh, that quarterbacks have now had close to an athletic lifetime of training. Uh, so as they, they get to each level of football, that they're just they're that much stronger, they're that much, um, they possess that much more mobility and stability and all those good things that we talk about in strength. Training, you know? Well, I think part of that is because we've, you know, at least what I've seen and we've had this discussion is, you know, the quarterbacks are sectioned off because they do need some level of specialized training, but, but they were also to, to some extent were babied a little bit. Um, and so they didn't get that physicality, um, unless they were in a situation where maybe it was a kid who was in a smaller school, who was your quarterback. But I mean, I've, I've been in, in programs where the quarterback was also our, our defensive end, you know, yeah. and those kid was, a was a monster. Um, so, you know, that, that kind of dictates what kind of athlete you're getting at the end of the day too. Sure. Yeah. And I think, uh, that the old days of, yeah, I can remember just even being a kid and seeing it wasn't all that unusual to see that quarterback who was also lining up at Mike linebacker for you, he said, you know, and just, uh, um, just because, you know, typically that guy, the, the quarterback back in those days was the guy who played shortstop on the baseball team. He never come off, come off the field. Maybe he returned kicks. He was a point guard in basketball, potentially like that type of, that type of guy. So yeah, I, I, I agree with you there. Now, going back to physical characteristics, there's there's some stuff in there that obviously there's there's things we can control, there's things we can't, uh, things like height. One of the other things that that I know comes up a bunch is hand measurement, right? The the uh, ability to have a larger hand is going to be able to manipulate the football. No different than a baseball pitcher with longer fingers is going to have a, a yeah. huge advantage. You know, uh, to to stroke you you Boston guys a little bit. Pedro Martinez was a very diminutive guy, but ex yeah. like freakishly long fingers could really get spin on the ball. Yeah. So, like, how much hand size plays into all the, and all the things that can matriculate into in their delivery. Yeah, I think I think there's a couple of primary things just as a football coach in general, as opposed to specifically someone who trains quarterbacks. I think um, as a coach, especially at the, the levels as players are coming up, like the pre-college levels, um, I think two things stand out. Number one is hand size means we have a better opportunity to possess the football. Smaller hands, we're in traffic. It could be diff more difficult to hang on to the football in traffic, those sorts of things. God forbid, think back to the old Doug Sudi days, running with one hand on the football, like that sort of thing. Um, you're not able to do that as effectively, as safely, uh, if you've got smaller hands. Where I think when it comes to throwing, I think essentially what it comes down to, I don't preclude quarterbacks with small hands from playing the position. I don't say, oh, you, can't, you can't play it. But I go into it with an understanding that I can't coach you the way that I coach the guy who measures eight and three quarters hands pinky to, to thumb tip if you've got if you've got you know seven and eighth inch hands hand you know span on your on your hand measurement I, I have to approach it a little differently and the biggest reason is you talked about you made a reference to baseball pitching and Pedro Martinez um, the combination of um, his ability to get external rotation in his shoulder but then as you said at the hand you the longer you can hold on to the football to be in contact with the football during delivery you stand a significantly better chance of getting more RPMs on the football and that, you know, we could dive, go down the physics rabbit hole and talk about, you know, what that means for flight path of a football, but it is pretty simple. Not only do you lose that advantage when you have shorter hands, but if you want to be able to spiral the football and your hands cannot cover enough surface area, that enough is a little bit, I won't say it's an inexact science, but it's a range of things. If we want to ultimately come off a ball that is not round and we want to come off it with our index finger last, let's say, even for those quarterback coaches that are out there that say they want their index finger and the inside edge of their middle finger, let's say, to come off the football last, it becomes more challenging the smaller the surface area you cover with the football. And I think we just see different things. So the delivery for the guy with the bigger hand um, who's able to come off the football with that index finger extended as he delivers – Versus the guy, because he can't cover surface area, he needs to change the way that he approaches that release and has to cut around underneath the football. It's the difference between a pitcher throwing 
a fastball or even like a screwball in here to someone who throws a slide or cuts under the under the baseball, for example. I think just to illustrate why I think it definitely does matter. And I again, I don't think it's prohibitive that we say you can't play the position, but I think we need to at least be aware enough as the person or persons who are coaching that quarterback to know that the mechanics are not one size fits all when we have that as kind of a, a reality or a limitation, you know. Now, throwing a football doesn't seem to have the same number of arm injuries at the, at the epidemic level that we see in baseball. Yeah. So how do you explain that? And is that something that you see changing? And are you starting to see more arm injuries with, with your quarterbacks? Yeah, I think what it is, is that they're different. I think the nature of the arm injuries, the one that I will, the one that I'll say, um, I think happens across the board and they're probably less catastrophic when we talk about the anterior of the shoulder, the kind of that front front of the shoulder capsule. Um, I see that guys who are um, multi-sport athletes, I see, this is this will probably give you a chuckle, but with the kind of proliferation of lacrosse as a sport, and I see some crossover between quarterbacks and lacrosse players um, at those pre-high school and high school ages, I do see that sometimes quarterbacks, and, and, and I think as we, as we talk here, we'll get into more of it, but I see quarterbacks that as they release a football, instead of being out a little bit more with the elbow out in front, we see quarterbacks that oftentimes almost lock out uh, at the elbow as they deliver the football and put an, an enormous amount of stress on the front side of the shoulder as they deliver. Um, so I see that like kind of a, that persistent, like, you know, reporting of like tendonitis type. Uh, so I don't know if I'd say catastrophic injury as much as common complaints of discomfort and it really limiting um, quarterbacks in general. The injuries that I see um, in, in football, I think uh, fewer and far between relative to baseball. Um, this is not by way of science, but just I've got eyes and I'm around baseball was my first love. And so I pay a lot of attention to throwing athletes in other sports. Um, I will say, I, I, I do believe that you cannot play football, even if you're a seven on seven guy, you cannot play football and get the number of throws that I see baseball players getting now, particularly pitchers with multiple, sometimes three seasons a year or four seasons a year of baseball. So the traditional spring, um, many years ago, you might play spring baseball in your town league, your city league, whatever it was. And if you were fortunate enough to make an all-star team, you might be playing from beginning or mid April to maybe middle of July or later in July. And you may be playing a volume of games. That's a, a quarter or a third of what I see some guys who are just regular plain old baseball players who didn't make any kind of all-star team. They just come up playing an inordinate amount of games. They're playing two double headers in a weekend. They're on travel baseball teams where they're constantly at it. Um, add into that uh, year round workouts, oftentimes specialized training. And sometimes I think that the specialized training does not always connect the dots between what they are teaching at Athletes, particularly young athletes in their formative uh, years with things like connective tissue and just body growth in general. But I don't think that the dots are connected between the workouts prescribed and the coaching that's being given and the possibility um, of overuse. Um, I, don't, I don't think that assessments are being made to figure out just how much volume am I putting an athlete through. When I train quarterbacks, I could easily in a one-on-one -on -one 60 minute session, I could probably have a quarterback throw without too much trouble, 300 to 350 balls. If I wanted to, and I just wanted to make it about, hey, this is going to be a glorified game of catch for 60 minutes. I'm going to put you through these different types of throws. Um, but I don't know the value in it. Um, I would hope that most folks that train quarterbacks individually would realize that there's a lot to the position. And we don't simply need to make it about throwing as many reps as possible, but focus instead on quality reps. Um, and then, so the, the last thing, not to go too far off the point of your original question, the other thing that when it comes to baseball, uh, especially for pitchers, I do think there's an element of when we introduce the volume of throws that kids are making at young ages in a formal, in a formal environment. Sometimes our adults are the worst thing that ever happened to young athletes. And I think I think, think back to my own childhood. We played a lot. We played a lot of sports a lot of the time. It felt like from the time you know in the morning, especially during the warmer months, to when the sun went down. And, but it was outside the realm of organized athletic activity and, and, and being in that truly competitive, my team versus your team, which is guys out, kids out, 
having fun and playing. I do think for pitchers in particular, just the fact that they're throwing from a higher plane and throwing downhill. Um, again, this is not, I haven't gone far enough down that path to know in any kind of empirical, reliable data kind of way, what effect does that have? But I certainly know that the, you know, overall just, just torque and the velocity that we're dealing with on the throwing. There's a reason the pitchers throw from the mound. There's a lot you could do with a baseball when I'm elevated, you know, X amount of inches off the ground. So I think all of that is kind of a perfect storm to create an environment where injuries, injuries are more prevalent. And it doesn't really translate to football that way because I don't think we have that same opportunity for overuse. Last point, quarterbacks do suffer overuse. But I think what presents for me is more not severe, catastrophic Tommy John surgery type injuries. It's more discomfort and overuse that can be a little more preemptively um, catered to and dealt with. Well, I'm going to jump in with one more thing here and, and you can't see it, but Mike is just grinning because you brought up lacrosse and that's his, that's his wheel, one of his wheelhouses. But um, one of the things with throwing um, and I talk about this with, with both baseball players, but also bring it up with, with football because it's never really yeah. mentioned with them. At least yeah. there is some, there is some cognizance of, of monitoring throwing with pitch counts and so forth, whether people yeah. abide by them, that's a whole nother story. But yeah. at least there's some cognizance of volume and and cognizance of of intent with baseball because you have radar guns and you have pitch counts. Whereas right. with football, we don't have that. And I have to explain the basics of throwing is that you have two things. You have intensity and you have volume. Intensity, how hard you throw. Volume, how much you throw. Yeah. I said, you need to build up both. And I said, you can't really do both at the same time. If you're going to throw really hard, you can't throw it a lot. That's called yeah. being a starting pitcher. That's why they got to wait five days before they throw yeah. again. Yep. Um, so you got to do some days you're just working on touch and it's nice and nice and easy. And you could do a bunch of throws and you're working on some mechanical stuff. And, and then there's other days where you got to let it rip and you're going to build your arm strength. Cause the only way you get good at throwing hard is practicing throwing hard. So yep. balancing out those days, the problem you have, and where I see with the overuse is you get the quarterback who hasn't picked up a football, um, since, you know, last November and all of a sudden they show up in June for their shorts and t-shirt practices and their coach has them making 200 throws and they're and now their arms barking so it's just that incredible ramp up which yep. if a smart baseball player will ramp up gradually over their spring to yep. get up to that where quarterbacks just get thrown right to the fray and we don't think of the same thing with arms yeah I I, I agree with that and I've seen that and uh so one of the things that i I try to do at the different levels that I've coached at, you have varying levels of, of control when it comes to, especially if it's at the high school level. And if you happen to have that guy who's a three sport athlete. So I typically um, try to keep our, our early off season. And by that, I mean, uh, for the most part in high school football, I always prescribe, let's take the month of December, just about entirely off. You know, let's just go ahead and just give our body some time and just say, I'm going to give it a break. As we get into the winter months, the January, I would really say January through April, um, coaching and having coached in the Northeast where spring ball is not happening, uh, spring football um, is not happening, uh, where we've got 15 or 16 practices over a several week period where it's just like preseason camp, essentially. Um, when that's not happening, I try to really limit the throw count, my quarterbacks and say, hey, if you can get, um, if you can throw the football, whether it's supervised by me or you're doing it on your own if you're a multi-sport guy, um, really keeping the number of throws. It's really with an emphasis. I call them perfect throws. Try to emphasize mechanically the points that we talk about, the, the coaching points that are specific to you as an individual quarterback athlete. Uh, try to focus on those and make throws that are in the range of, you know, half to three quarters, as you said, velocity, full speed of what you're capable of throwing, uh, just to emphasize those points. And, and in those winter months, I say, if you're up over 100 throws a week, I think it's too much. I think anything from, you know, a few dozen to, to under 100 throws, I think is ideal. So that when you do get thrown back into the throw, you said the, the fray, you said uh, like the shorts and t-shirts practices come June. Or uh, another example might be the, uh, uh, we get into the seven on seven season, which has really grown here in recent years. If, uh, if we can, it's a, it's a way for us to ramp up. And, and again, don't make it a bucket of cold water in the face when we step back out of the field and we're just zero to 60 right away. You know? Hey everybody, a quick break in the action here. Hope you're enjoying the show and we appreciate you listening. 
We're working hard to bring you the highest quality content and best guest every single week. So if you could do us a big favor and go and like and subscribe to the show on whatever platform you get your podcasts on, it would be greatly appreciated. Be sure to listen at the end of the show also to find out more information about our courses, as well as a special discount code for all our listeners. Thanks again, and let's get back to the show. Let's talk about mechanics a little bit and uh, more particularly uh, just passing mechanics. What are the fundamentals that every quarterback should be doing to throw the ball well consistently? Yeah, I think what we find from everyone is there's something to do with a, and I'm trying to stay away from anything that's stylistic or particularly what I teach, but I think in general, those universal things, the same way every effective baseball batter is going to load his hand back before he goes to swing the bat. Same thing with the quarterback, that there's going to be some sort of load phase where we bring the ball actually in the opposite direction of where we're going to throw it to take advantage of whatever term we're going to apply to it, whether it's elastic energy or, or, or whatever, just to get ourselves kind of that, that, that lead. The second is that we release the ball in a way, and this is for a moment, ignoring for a moment what um, the effective type of throw for it, the, the type of route that it is, or defensive leverage, but delivering the ball in a way that does not, in the short or long term, lead to repetitive use injuries. Like it's not, that should never be a pain point. It should never be like, ah, oh, when I do this, it doesn't feel good. So I always want to make sure that guys have, there's some sort of load phase that can be as compact and as efficient as we can make it, because they are all built differently and we have to modify, um, that, our, that our release does not lead to any physical either discomfort or, or injury. And then finally, that there's a transfer of weight from back to front. So as we go through that load, there's obviously, we're not going to be leaning forward as we go backward like this. So there's got to be some sort of gathering. And again, Eric, I'm doing my best to stay away from a stylistic approach to this. But as I, as I go through that load and I have my weight back, making sure that the transfer that then happens as I come forward to throw the football has a landing, a landing spot, meaning where I have seen quarterbacks run into difficulties with overuse and that sort of thing, I find that quarterbacks who don't land well. So for the right-handed quarterback, as his left foot contacts the ground, it facilitating the rotation that we hope happens, hips up through trunk to deliver the football. If you don't land in a way that's receptive to that kind of movement, what you're going to wind up with is someone who either, say, locks out that front leg and someone who's then dependent on a throw that really generates the majority of its power and force from like the rib cage on up, as opposed to someone who's really leveraging the ground consistently all the way through from, from the moment that you, you load that football back to the moment that you release it, that the relationship to the ground, we're using the ground effectively to, to kind of get that, that holistic rotation as we deliver the ball. So I'm going to give it a more complicated answer to a really simple question, Mike, but that's all. Those are the things that when I watch a quarterback and evaluate him, those are the things that stand out for the first time, especially when I just see how he throws the ball. All right. So now, let's make it uh, No, Go ahead, uh, Mike. No, I was just going to say, so if you're working with, you know, a growing athlete, so maybe, maybe this, you know, middle school or high school athlete, and obviously with, with the growth that's continuing to happen, literally they're getting, they're getting bigger and, you know, there's so much growth going on in their entire system. Yeah. Um, if you see opportunities to maybe, you know, work on their stride when they release or maybe change their mechanics uh, because you, you feel as if maybe improving range of motion here or there will be optimal for them. Is there any times where you do or don't want to do that because you don't want to sort of disturb the current system and, and you don't want to throw too much into the, to the mix and, and have something go off rails. Right. So, cause you, if, if someone's good, they're good for a reason. So how much do you look at where is your opportunity to change? But if you try to do too much too soon, you could screw them up. So how do you, how do you approach that? Sure. So I think the, the first two is a great, great question. And one that I think we all should no matter. I mean, you could apply this to so many disciplines within just physical training. Um, I think I want to know, does the athlete that I'm working with do what I'm asking them to do effectively? And is it, does the athlete do it pain and injury free? Those are the top two questions for me that always matter. Um, so if there's a quarterback who is who has a slightly lower arm slot, let's say, and so from my seated position here, let's say, ideally, as kind of a general rule, I'll shift the way I'm uh, seated a little bit there. 
So as a general rule, I would like to say that I'd like the elbow to live parallel to the armpit, maybe slightly higher in general and get into the reasons why what I've seen over the years in terms of impact on the elbow and the throw. But in, in general, kind of my cookie cutter approach would be that I would like to see that. If there's a quarterback, say we have two different quarterbacks that are both somewhat south of that. So they live a little bit below the armpit, let's say. And let's say that um, uh, both of them do so without injury, uh, without injury, without presenting any pain. So that's one thing that I have to be mindful of right away. But let's say that one of them has, in two games, had six balls batted down at the line of scrimmage. <laughs> let's say that, that it was just, you know, those type of, those type of results that we were seeing on the field that we say, listen, consistently this is impacting your game. It's impacting the way you execute the job, and we can't, we can't live like this. We can't do it. But if we have – so, Eric, you and I have had conversations about the different phases – not, you know, so I've typically broken things down into six phases of throwing. So when we, uh, it's not one of those things where you got to hit all six of these or you're not going to be an effective quarterback. I have seen effective quarterbacks that do three of the six well, you know, or, or, or at least by what, you know, has been prescribed as this would represent sound movement, et cetera. Um, so I always want to make sure that we really pay attention um, to what the end goal is here. And the end goal is to have an effective quarterback who can throw the ball well not to pass Coach Johnston's magic checklist. So we're not, we're not, the end result is not to go do this in a lab somewhere. It's to do it on a football field on a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. So we want to be able to do it effectively. If we're not presenting issues um, around injury and around effectiveness, I think we stay away from that. Now, you talked about a population, especially, let's say, like an adolescent population. Like you're dealing with a quarterback like age 10 to, say, 16, 17, which – I've dealt with over the years very frequently. Um, so there are times there's someone who looks really fluid mechanically. And then let's say a kid comes off a winter basketball season where I haven't seen that athlete, you know, really if that much from the previous summer, really. And now they come back and it's always a guy who's been pretty mechanically sound. I've seen this play out many times. But now it's just a little bit, something's a little bit off. There's something in the chain that just doesn't look right. Um, what, I, what I usually try to, always apply to those type of athletes is make sure that we look at things from the ground up. Why? Because um, I think release points are the things that are most, they're the easiest, they're the lowest hanging fruit. So he may have been coached by a dozen people since you saw him last summer. And now, and some of them might be really competent and some of them might be entirely incompetent and not qualified to have an opinion <laughs> on what his arm slot is like or what he's got to do or this some you guys can appreciate it. sometimes some pretty crazy advice comes from grandpa or whoever just happens to offer an opinion uh, so the, the, the reason that i want to focus on the ground on up is nobody really pays attention to that in any meaningful way people say footwork all the time but i think the uninitiated the folks who are not really you know the passing mechanic geeks in the world like me they're not really paying uh significant attention to the athletes to the quarterback's relationship to the ground so i usually try to start there and it's a good place to begin because so often, yeah, there's something different about the way they're throwing the ball, but there also might be a difference for the way, you know, their base is now six inches wider. He's living entirely outside the range of both of his hips in the pocket where before he was stacked shoulders over hips over feet and everything flowed pretty smoothly for him in just, you know, the length of his segments and all of that. Um, I think the other thing just to keep in mind here is we do not always grow perfectly symmetrically. So it, there are spurts where it feels like you look at an athlete and you're like, wow, it just looks like he has a longer torso than he used to, or his arms look longer, but not necessarily in perfect unison with the rest of his growth and, you know, the ways that he got vertical in other ways, you know? Um, so I think start from the ground up is the way that I want to approach it. Um, and don't tinker too much with the actual release point until we have some real good answers to some basic questions along the chain from the ground on up. Now, when it comes to addressing limitations, whether it's in their uh, delivery or physical limitations, you and I have had this discussion is about the dogmatic way that we traditionally have gone about it and coaches have gone about it is really 180 degrees out of phase. So if you have someone who lacks mobility and good movement, the answer is always, well, we're going to give them bands and stretching. Um, when that may not necessarily be the case, that it may be a motor control issue, that it may be a coordination issue. Then if you have that kid who just 
lacks zip on the ball and just doesn't have enough juice um, or doesn't have enough strength when they're trying to gain that extra yard or let's just bench squat and, and deadlift and clean this kid when maybe that's not the answer either. I'm not saying that's necessarily bad, but they not maybe the answer either. Or maybe you have that person who just doesn't have the physical capacity that starts to wear down and, and doesn't necessarily have the ability to maintain their com physical composure through four quarters. And we think we're going to fix that with gassers. So let's talk about like preparation of a quarterback of how we got to be a little bit more specific whether it's addressing those unique movement limitations that tie together specifically with some of those limitations and delivery, or just overall globally in terms of the preparation physically, how what we've traditionally done doesn't always check those boxes. Correct. I think uh, I, I agree. We, we've got, um, I've, I've known some quarterbacks that were, they look like yoga instructors on a static stretch and they can do like some really incredible movements. But when they, for example, transfer their weight from their throwing foot um, onto that, that off foot as they land, as they deliver the football, um, they may just have no ability to get any internal rotation uh, in that front hit and the, you know, the non-throwing hit. And it's, it's really apparent even to the uninitiated You say, Hey, look at the way that this guy finishes, look how stiff his leg is. And he doesn't. So that the, the, that stiffness that maybe was identified initially, we prescribed a whole bunch of static stretching for it and, you probably still got that essentially that same kind of lower half delivery movement and behavior from an athlete. So I think it is important that we apply um, the right prescriptive measures to it. And I think it goes back to what we discussed before, which is it's got to either be performance based or if we're hearing complaints around, you know, pain, discomfort, injury, then that's a, that's a whole other thing. We want to obviously take that offline and make sure that we get that looked at. But when it comes to the performance based piece, in general, we have to start somewhere. So um, in designing uh, programs or um, sets of drills for quarterbacks, for quarterback coaches in particular to use with an athlete or multiple athletes, say at the start of a spring season, at the start of a fall camp, uh, we, we have some universal things uh, or features within drills that we want to see quarterbacks be able to do pretty well. We want to see them be able to have an effective drop. We want to be able to see them. Um, locate their points and deliver a football to, to leverage. You want to see them be able to throw different types of football with different types of trajectories. So in general, what I would want to inform corrections would be the physical performance. And sometimes that can be that they just didn't learn the drill well, or they just weren't paying attention. Or they weren't a good listener. Other times we can get to a point where we say, you know what, very specifically, he's showing, um, results that don't fit with what we'd like them to be able to execute in a physical drill. And that can involve a very specific area. At that point, I think it's okay to, to put them through some type of screen. We've talked much, uh, you know, a lot of conversations about this, right? Put them through a specific screen that's related to something very specific about what they're not able to effectively do and then have, and then try to get some information, some feedback from that screen and say, ah, well, no wonder this guy is not able to do, uh, you know, for example, for the guy who just looks like he's kind of pushing the football and we say, you know, this guy really gets no external rotation um, as he, you know, as he approaches the launch phase of throwing the football, um, then maybe we want to investigate that a little bit and find out, well, let's test it. Why is it that he has really poor external rotation? Um, and so then we go through that very specific screen and then potentially if the screen results dictate, then we move to some sort of physical correction, a movement correction that then it can loop us back to put him back into that same original environment and let him do the drill work that we originally detected something might not be right with and see if he's able to then do that effectively. I think that in general terms, I think that's kind of that, that loop that we should be on um, as opposed to a one size fits all um, or a really over generalized approach. I mean, we're doing specific training for a reason. We, I think we owe it to the athletes that we work with to make it so that we can, have, we can have some kind of informed decisions as opposed to kind of throwing darts at the board and figure out like, yeah, maybe it's this, you know? Absolutely. So, all right. So if you had the opportunity to sit down with, um, you know, every aspiring quarterback, uh, young quarterback and their, and their parents, right? Yeah. What are the three biggest pieces of advice, the top three things that you would suggest to them 
as they sort of develop their path to trying to, you know, go as far as possible? What are the top three things you would tell the, the, the family and the kid? Yeah. So number one, I'd say parents, uh, don't be the worst thing that ever happened to your quarterback, um, and make sure that this thing is fun. You know, um, uh, it, it's, we can really take the joy out of, out of sports. That's one thing that I've seen happen. You know, I've been alive for a while now and I've seen, <laughs> I've seen, I, sometimes I feel like athletes currently young athletes, Sometimes it feels like a job a little bit earlier than it should. So um, having coached quarterbacks at many levels, the one thing that I think, I think it's okay for a college quarterback or an NFL quarterback to feel like playing quarterback is more like a job for a bunch of reasons. Number one, you're playing it essentially at adulthood um, and you're playing it for different types of motivations beyond just certainly there's a love for it. You have to have it. You want to do it effectively, I think. But then you also might might be doing it. There may be financial considerations. You may be getting your education as a result of it. Um, uh, that that sort of thing. But for younger guys, I think if it's really feeling like a job at a young age, uh, I think we got to look at the people that are in our our circle. I think we have to look at just kind of the overall approach. This should still be primarily fun. And I'm not just saying it just in kind of a sentimental way. I really mean that. An example of that would be. Um, and it feeds into number two, which is, I'd say, avoid over-specialization at an extremely young age. I just don't think it's, it's helpful and useful. I think there are things that inform and help a quarterback that, are, um, that can be developed um, in other sports. I think that um, being an effective Mike for you, a lacrosse player, can really have some good translation over to football, I think baseball, I think basketball, certainly, about just you know being able to, to – we play defense and basketball. We've got to have a good base where our, our hips have access to the ground because of the way we, like those sorts of things. So avoiding, uh, but then avoiding an over-specialization, I think is really crucial for, um, for the younger guys. So many of the athletes that I see are, I'm astonished at the younger and younger ages through which over-specialization also to me doesn't mean this kid only plays football. Some kids only like football. I don't really feel like doing other stuff, but you know, at, and they're playing stuff in gym class at recess, they're shooting baskets in the schoolyard, whatever it is, they're doing other things. That's okay. But I also mean that we're simply overtraining. Like we cannot take the joy out of this thing. Like there's, there are times where I'll turn away parents or coaches who want me or us to work with a younger client uh, at a point where I just either, I'm just concerned because the athlete is so young that maybe it's just they're not quite ready for it. Or after meeting for an initial intake session, meeting an athlete, I'm thinking like, this guy is not ready for this at this point. And I don't think it's going to be really effective help. So if we can avoid that flavor of over-specialization as well, I think is really important. And the third thing that I would say is, um, is that we don't, we, we look at, specifically when it comes to quarterbacks, we look at training the position holistically. And I guess all three of these points kind of they're interwoven through each other um, that we, that we make sure, for example, that it's not just, we're not trying to develop a kid who looks good at a showcase, at a camp, uh, at a, only at a seven on seven. We want a guy who can actually play the position in a way that's effective in real football, because ultimately decisions that get made around your child's football future as a quarterback will be primarily made around how they play um, how they play real football you know and I just think we're in a climate now where I see lots and lots there's a lot of parent ball a lot of daddy ball um, where quarterbacks are they grow up in a way that doesn't allow and this has to do with kind of keeping keeping the fun sometimes the fun comes with some lumps along the way many many quarterbacks that I encounter now have had that ability to cope the development of that kind of stunted along the way because they never got to experience failure without their dad being the head coach or the offensive coordinator on their youth team, making excuses for them or, or whatever. There's a million scenarios we can cook up. But they don't have the ability uh, as they get to the high school and sometimes the college level to really cope with failure, with uh, 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 sometimes friction, between position coaches or coordinators and the quarterback themselves. 
this is like an, I, I think a, a really important piece of all of this. It doesn't fall directly within the, you know, the three things that I have in it, but it is closely related to all of them. That overall, we got to let athletes develop some ability, just human ability, to be able to deal with difficult circumstances around things like failure and around things like interpersonal relations and and just we don't tinker and try to control the outcomes for the for the quarterback. I think the quarterback in the long term has a greater chance of success standing on their own two feet as they do it. So if I can interject with with kind of three things, you know, on my end uh, from the, the multiple conversations that Chris and I have had over the years yeah. is um, one is to follow up your point is, and Chris, you've seen me do this multiple times with our quarterbacks when we work together uh, at Hudson is that is how they carry themselves and how they carry themselves all day, how they carry themselves in the weight room and they, how they carry themselves when there's not a football in their hand. Sure. And I've grabbed those kids and said, look, if you expect 10 guys who to look you in the eye Friday night and to put full trust into you, you need to carry yourself better. And you can't wait till Friday night for that to happen. Yep. You, how you carry yourself as a leader and how you can command a room of, of sometimes grown men is an, an incredible, important and tangible that that person can go in there and, and have that, you know, that stiff spine to be able to control the environment and control the tempo and emotion of the team, I think is incredibly valuable. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I would agree with that, Eric, just to interject with um, very quickly. I think that it's, it's a, it, it really applies to anything. Um, you're essentially, I, I joke with quarterbacks all the time and say, listen, you are not the guy on fries. You are the manager of McDonald's here. When you're, when you're a quarterback, you, you got to be the one that people are looking to for advice, for leadership, and for consistency. Sometimes it's not even something that's spoken. It's just that you have to be relied upon to, to be remarkably consistent. Um, you can't be late for meetings. You can't be late to school. You can't be a clown in class. You can't be the person who doesn't take uh, his assignments seriously, who doesn't know. Essentially, I tell quarterbacks, Guys better be able to come up to you on the field and ask you what their job is, not just your. Um, it's just part of the position. If you don't want to do it, you can play wide out, or you can play, you can play another position. But I think it's it's really crucial that you said everything from demeanor to the way that you just appro approach your your day to day. Um, those teammates' eyes are always watching, uh, and they, they they very much will draw their conclusions around how much they can respect you and follow you uh, based on those things that often are not always directly related to football. Yeah. And, and as I used to joke with the quarterbacks, when I coached myself, when, when my kids were coming up and coaching at the, the, the middle school level, and I lay all these expectations on the quarterback and their eyes would like roll back and say, well, it's tough. Right. And I say, yeah, well, that's why Tom Brady's married to a supermodel and all the linemen have to eat lunch with each other, you know, <laughs> because that's, that's why you get the big bucks. Now, another another two points you brought up that I don't want to make sure get glossed over is one, you talked about the difference between fundamentals and style, right? Mm -hmm. There's there's the fundamentals that are that are kind of all encompassing for everybody. And then there's style and and, you know, some funny stories I'll bring up is one. We had a, a quarterback that Chris and I both worked with and the dad said, hey, can you teach him to throw like Patrick Mahomes? And, you know, I joked and I said, yeah, well, here's all you got to do is is dad, you need to go back and come back in your next life as a. Uh, major league baseball pitcher because that's what Mahomes dad was yeah. and then you need to have your son be an all-state shortstop because that's what Patrick was in high school so once you could do those two things yeah I'm happy to teach him those things yeah it's uh for sure there's uh there's there's some of the things that um uh, that are we we can't necessarily control that are uh, <laughs> that that are kind of the the blank canvas that you come to the table with is not always the same blank canvas you know when you compare athlete to athlete and one more thing before you wrap it up, Mike, I do attribute one of my greatest lines for sports parents ever. I attribute to coach Johnson. We were uh, having a conversation. I called Chris because my kids are playing in a baseball tournament and it was out by where he was coaching at the time. And I see like young middle school kids, like maybe fifth, sixth graders in full gear practicing. Um, and, and it's like April. And I call him up. I go, do you maniacs actually have tackle spring football for these middle school kids in, in april and his line to this day i use with every psycho parent he says eric you know what that is that is a formula to make sure that your kids are riding a skateboard and smoking a cigarette in front of the bowling alley when he's 17 and nothing has ever been more true and nothing's been a better line so with that i'll, I'll leave you to, to wrap it up mike 
All right, coach. Well, thank you so much for sharing uh, all of your knowledge today and obviously the stories that go along with it. And uh, do us a favor, tell us what, what projects you have uh, that you're working on in the next year and, and what you have coming up. Sure. So over the next few months, uh, we'll be we'll be out on the clinic circuit for sure. Um, we'll have updates, you know, on our social platforms and at completely.com announcing where we'll be through the winter and spring months. Always excited to get out there and talk football with coaches and be able to dive down into it. If you're talking quarterback mechanics over a two or a three hour uh, series of, you know, one hour talks, two or three of them in a row, it's great because you can dive pretty deep into it and you can That's talk awesome. descriptive stuff. And it's a lot of fun to do that. Um, also in the new year, uh, planning a launch, um, our, really our first foray like significantly into um, a course for uh, coaching quarterback passing mechanics and to a variety of audiences. So we'll have more details about that coming, but really excited about um, going down that avenue of, of quarterback play and being able to kind of disseminate what is our, our approach to coaching quarterback and some of the knowledge that, that we've accumulated and I think some of the techniques that are effective um, for, for quarterbacks as well. So it's been a lot of fun speaking with you guys today. I really appreciate you having me on. And, uh, it was a blast. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's always a pleasure, Chris. And looking forward to that course. I know that you pulled some of the most brilliant minds in the field in to help you with that. So uh, we'll yes. keep you posted as, as that all comes together. But uh, and then and, and thank you for listening. And this has been the Principles of Performance podcast. Thank you for listening to the Principles of Performance podcast. If you've enjoyed our content, please like and share on your social media outlets as well as subscribe and give us a review on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or whatever your preferred platform is to listen to. For more information on the Principles of Program Design courses and workshops, visit us at www.principlesofprogramdesign.com and follow us on all of the social media channels where we post new content every day. To save 10% on any PPD courses, enter the discount code PRINCIPLESPODCAST10 at checkout. If you have any questions we can answer or suggestions for the show, you can email us at info at principlesofprogramdesign.com or message us on social media. Thank you again for your support.